job done here between Storm and Sneak and Show. We saw Peter a little bit earlier. He actually lost when he was on camera, but that's about the only loss he's had this weekend. I think so. I mean, he really ran through this tournament first overall seed, our last undefeated player. We only had him on camera once, and that was a loss he took to Rudy Briscoe in round 11, but uh, shook it off, and first overall seed. Peter taking a mulligan here. It looks like he's going to go down to six cards. Merriam with his storm deck focused and ready, as this is a big opportunity for him. If he wins this tournament, 25 Open Series points, and likely number one overall for season one. It's a huge jump. No two ways about it. We saw Lissette make that jump last weekend after the win in Columbus. And those players are battling between Lissette, Kevin Jones, Ross Merriam, and Jim Davis. Johnson going to take a look at his hand. Does not look thrilled. But looks like he's going to keep it. Number one overall seed. So he's on the play here. Let's see how our semifinals will begin. It's a polluted delta. And just a passing of the turn. Merriam will draw. And he will sacrifice his polluted delta, go down to 19 in the process. And it's an underground C as usual here for the Storm player. And the real secret to this matchup from Peter's side of the table is not Emrakul, it is Crystal Brown, because he can easily show and tell in Emrakul, pass the turn and not untap. Yep. Crystal Brown gives him the opportunity to draw a bunch of cards, find some force of wills to carry over to the next turn, and then kill Ross. That's a preordain here. And that will resolve. So Miriam will do a little scry action. And Ross, happy with his configuration, will take his card and pass the turn back over to Johnson. Johnson going to sacrifice his polluted delta. I imagine a volcanic island. He does have some other options available to him. Yeah, he can be very liberal about getting non-basic lands here because no wastelands, of course, in Ross's list. Nothing to punish him for it. After he does get his cards all situated, there is the volcanic island. I do think this one will be pretty close. It is all about speed. There is a little bit of interaction on both sides of the ball. Though. The games will be, I think, in the 50-50 range, which makes them close in that sense. But there's not going to be any interaction here. I mean, it's one person getting to do their thing while another person watches. There is a preordain. Over master sneak attack, the cards Johnson's looking at. Overmaster card doesn't play a big role in this particular match. It does cantrip, so that's always nice, but the uncounterability of the next sorcery, not a big deal given that Merriam does not have counter magic. Both cards are going to go to the bottom. Johnson will take a draw. It is a card I like in the deck a lot, though. It's a low opportunity cost way of beating counter spells, which can be challenging in certain games. This is a ponder from Merriam. That will resolve, so he'll take a look at the top three. And we'll see if he likes what he looks at as he moves some cards around. He's happy, happy. Keeps with the ponder, takes his card. Here's a volcanic island. Here's another ponder. That one will resolve as well. And Peter seems very content to just sit on Fluster Storm. It's a good piece of disruption here. And if Ross leads off with Cabal Therapy, he's more likely than not to name Force of Will, because there's four copies of it, than the two Fluster Storms. So Peter taking his time here. In a relative sense, I mean, he's still trying to kill on turn three or turn four, but uh, he does have a good piece of protection here. I suppose as much as Sneak and Show can take its time. It's That's a slow game. Doing. We've yeah. entered the mid game. We're officially <laughs> there. Five total turns between these two players. Going to have to get a judge watch for slow play. Johnson searching up a volcanic island here on Miriam's end step. He's down to 18. See what he can put together on his third turn. Picked up a copy of Sneak Attack. Here's a preordain for him. Unsurprisingly, both these players just can tripping away. City of Traders and Misty Rainforest, the cards Johnson's looking at. One on top, one on bottom. He'll take one with him. Misty Rainforest, the weapon of choice. And he's just going to pass the turn back. Once again, you're the standard top eight. Attacks he improved. 
So Ross is going to have a good idea of what's going on in the hand now. It was an ancient tomb. That was the card he was holding back. Now here's the hand. A sneak attack. Not playing the, the ancient tomb there is really surprising. I mean, it means that any land next turn is a kill. Yeah, I'm, I'm very surprised by that decision. Holding back ancient tomb when next turn, if he draws land, as you mentioned, he can go ancient tomb, you know, he could, if he has ancient tomb in play, he plays sneak attack and activates it. Yeah, I mean, e Ember Cole hit you down to two with no permits to play is not necessarily game over for Ross, but well, I don't know why you would want to cut off that line of play. Yeah. I don't know, I don't, not entirely sure what concealing that information does. Right. Here's a ponder. Ross going to shuffle. And I'm sure Ross is a little befuddled as well. There's no, there's no risk. There's no counters. There's no wastelands. You know. It just strikes me as a play that's too fancy. Yeah. Trying to you know really take your opponent by surprise by the fact that you can do this all in one turn. It's like well that's the expectation. Yeah. That if what your deck does is, you know, grandiose. Mystery card coming here from the ponder. So that's done resolving. You have to imagine Miriam's looking for some sort of discard spell. Yeah, I mean, that's the one piece of disruption he's got to beat. Any Cabal Therapy or Dress will do. Assuming that he's got the rest of the hand rolled up. There's Lotus Petal. And he'll just pass the turn back. Johnson going to draw. He's going to play a Brainstorm now. So three cards coming here for him. Force of Will and Ponder among them. So we'll have to put two cards back. I think yeah, Force of Will a huge deal, though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it already feels like Ross is stumbling a little bit here. And being another counter spell that he isn't aware of, that's going to be tough. Go deploy the Ancient Tomb now and pass the turn back. Miriam will draw. Here's Cabal Therapy. And this should be interesting. A lot of the time, Miriam has named Forceful with this card over the course of the weekend. And we'll see if he continues to do so here. even though he knows his opponent has Fluster Storm in hand. The hand will be revealed. And he's going to go with Emmerpool here, it looks like. So going to take away one of the ways for Johnson to get the job done here. And what that's also going to do is shuffle Johnson's library. Yeah, one of the cards that Johnson put back was his sneak attack. Yeah. So now he is without a thing to put into play and a thing with which to put it into play. And you see the Force of Will and the Flusterstorm over there for Johnson. I think maybe he was thinking, well, he'll probably name Sneak Attack or he'll name Force of Will. E he either he's going to name Sneak Attack or Counterspell. Right. With the chance that he'll name Emrakul, and Ross really just blew him up by doing that. And yeah, that was a really impressive play. So now Johnson gets to shuffle his deck, which a lot of the time that's a good thing after resolve a Brainstorm, but this time that's not good at all. Yeah, he was expecting both Sneak Attack and Emrakul to be available to him. And now he's got to restart from scratch. Well, he does have a Ponder to get the show rolling. So we'll take a look at the top three cards. Red Elemental Blast among them. Looks like a Sneak Attack and a Preordained 2. So Ponder is done resolving. It's just really tough on Peter's hand the way it is right now because he it seems like he's really committed to leaving up the Flusterstorm as long as he can, which I agree with, but 
His hand is so clogged with cantrips and stunning his development to some extent. There's a swamp from Miriam. Very quickly passing the turn back. Johnson will draw a card. It's another ponder. So he'll get a good look at three of them. And he does not like those, so he will shuffle very quickly. Yeah, this is a person looking for Gristlebrand or Emberpool. Do it all in one turn. Next turn, potentially, if he draws one of his large creatures. Mystery card coming here. Just passing the term. Still trying to hold Flusterstorm as much as possible. Unwilling to put that shield down. Well, Flusterstorm plus Force of Will is a lot of protection. Here's a Lion's Eye Diamond. And just a passing the turn here for Marion. Yeah, I think Ross is at eight cards in hand last turn, so he would have had to discard the hand size otherwise. This is a preordain. Take a look at two of them. Emerald one, Gristle Prance the other. That's not so bad. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That'll play. The question is, is it time to make a move? Uh, I would say so. Yeah. I don't think it's getting any better. It's a show and tell. And if you're familiar with Storm, no counter spells here. Sneak attack's gonna come in. Johnson gonna sacrifice his land. Go and dig out a volcanic island, I imagine. There that is. And he knows the coast is clear for an Everpool beatdown. And what it looks like here is Miriam's hand is just not coming together at all this game. Yeah, well, I just, I, I think it's the absence of discard. He knows he can't go for it just yet because he's been having to beat Force of Will and Fluster Storm now for a while. There's no action to be taken until he finds him discard. He's just found more mana. And Peter can do this knowing that Ross does not have a, a good response. Annihilator six, bye bye permanence. And Ross does go to two. And if Peter has no follow-up, then he gets some opportunity to try to rebuild. It's not impossible. We've seen we've seen crazier stuff before in oh, exactly yes. this scenario, but uh, things are looking grim for Ross, especially given the quality of Peter's hand. I've had to do a cartwheel because of it. Correct. So I am well aware of what is possible from the Sneak and Show deck as far as its inability to cooperate. It is rather rare. Flooded Strand the draw. Time to go cantripping. Overmaster. There's a ponder two. Overmaster gonna go to the bottom. Other card will stay on top. So Priya done stun resolving. And there is ponder. So another shot at it here for Johnson. Take a look at three of them. And it looks like one of them is what the doctor ordered. There is Emrakul, and there is the W. Peter Johnson gonna win game number one here over Ross Merriam. Merriam's still digging, clearly did not find what he was looking for as Sneak and Show is up a game here over Storm. And in a matchup that I feel is pretty solid for Sneak and Show for some of the reasons that you saw, Peter has the ability to execute a combo that it's hard for Ross to interact with. On top of that, Peter has counter spells to keep Ross off of what he's trying to do. Well, Tough mixture. I agree. We'll turn our attention to the sideboard here. We'll start with Miriam. Two Xantid Swarms, three Carpet of Flowers, three Abrupt Decays, two Chain of Vapor. And up to the Warrens, a Pyroclasm, a Tropical Island, and two copies of Massacre. I can get behind the Xantid Swarms here because Peter's only interaction is counter spells. And I think the two copies of Chain of Vapor is a borderline addition to the deck. But I do like the Xantid Swarms. Other side of things here for Johnson. He's got two Defense Grid, two Graft Trigger's Cage, two Pithy Needle, two Omniscience, two Through the Breach, a Wipe Away, an Elish Norn, Grand Cenobite, two Pyroclasms, and a Besager who shelters them all. So I like bringing in the copy of Omniscience here because 
I don't think Peter wants to be on turn delay. I think he wants to be winning the turn that he does what he's trying to do. So show and tell may not be as good if he has to go off through Emrakul. Uh, past that, I think the two copies of Graftaker's Cage are okay here, as Peter has limited interaction and something that keeps Ross off the passive flames at the least. But the rest of this, not very attractive. Fair enough. Quick update for you guys on another match. We're assuming we'll have time to jump there, but game one has just ended, and Daryl Ayers has won game one over David Long. That means the team are Delver and Kurt Ape yes. up a game over Lance. Wow. Bias reporting. And if he gets to the finals, you know, Two good matchups waiting for him in Sneak and Snow and Storm. I, I think that's true. Yeah, I think I think he'll take him. I think he'll take him. Kurt Ape looking to take a trophy home here in 2015. I expected maybe our modern open for that to happen, but not in Legacy. One of the first tempo decks in Magic's history was a deck called Monkey May I, and that was Kurt Ape's backed up by counter spells. There is a history here. There is a precedent. Do your homework. It's all cyclical. Meta games are all cyclical. I refuse to believe that was the name of the deck. Oh, yeah. Monkey oh. May I? Yeah. Kurt Apes, Gorilla Shamans, counter spells of various sorts. Who played this deck? I don't remember who. We need a little, we need a little sourcing here. I'm sure it was Mark Justice or one of those, those back in the day masters. Oh, this is way back when. Way back. I mean, this predates me by several years. I'm only a little dubious because the deck name is very good. Well, back then, I think there, uh, naming decks is more of a craft than it is now. I agree. Monkey May I is a delight. See, I think the best deck names have revolved around animals. Pretty much. Zoo There's is great. Dumbo Drop. Dumbo Drop, great deck name. Not entirely sure Snake Tongue counts, but I like that that's deck a, name. That's a horrendous deck name. I, wow. Tough crowd here, folks. It's true. This is what I have to deal with 40 weeks of the year. Mm-hmm. I think something sweet, and I'm told immediately before I can finish the sentence that it's terrible. You signed the contract too, man. You knew exactly what this was about. I did. There's really no getting out of it either. It's ironclad. I'm just, I'm stuck. What's wrong with Snake Tongue? Just pretty lame. Why? It's a, a, it has Mystic Snake and Flint Tongue Kavu, is that why? Hey, it's just a good name. Not feeling it. Fine. Call it Teamer Tongue. How about that? Better. <laughs> Good. This is better. Good. Worked my way up. That was a real deck. That's sort of. It, about. it refused. It didn't influence the. Didn't influence the Pro Tour the way it was expected to after its performance at New Jersey States. It's too bad. It's too bad. First and second place. Only two people in the room playing the deck. Who? Anyone I know? John Sonny, Craig Kremples. I know both those people. Yep. They broke nice. it. They broke it for New Jersey States. Nice. That's impressive stuff. I didn't yeah. know that. A little piece of New Jersey history. Yeah, always finding a way to get New Jersey into this broadcast. What's that? I mean, you you are the one who brought up Snake Tongue, my friend. That was not me. Someone say game two's underway? I believe you did. Looks like, <laughs> looks like it is. Ross Ram taking a look at his opening hand. He's happy enough with it. Peter Johnson currently up a game. He's going to keep as well. Miriam with the Xanthus Swarm. You got a feeling he'd bring these in. I think so. Uh, Peter, his only interaction really is counter spells. He can't kill this thing unless he's brought in his pyroclasms. So it seems like a good place to start. Grafter's Cage. Going to try to slow down the pass and flames kill. I'm skeptical of this kind of card against Storm because uh, I think when you're not taxing their life total, it's trivial for them to go off through Ad Nauseum. But sometimes their draw just is what it is, and they have to go off through Passive Flames, and it's nice to have a cage. Santa Swarm, one of my favorite sideboard cards. I can never get behind these kind of cards because they just feel like mulligans to me, but I understand in some matchups they're extremely powerful. Sometimes you got to force through the, the Goblin Char Belcher, man. Yeah, it's true. In this case, Miriam's trying to force through with Tendrils of Agony. Brainstorm here for Johnson. Excuse me, a preordain. I do apologize. I'm just a passing of the turn. Going to go back Miriam's way. In comes the bees. 
I don't think we're going to play very many more turns of this game. Yeah, it's, it's been fun. It's had its twists and its turns. It sure has. But it's the third turn of the game, and it's gone on for far too long. Inferno Tudor on the stack. Crack both these Lion's Eye Diamonds. Pass and Flames will be discarded. Now, again, Pass and Flames is not the route that Miriam can go here. It's going to have to be the Ad Nauseam show. Yeah. Unless, of course, Ross has a way to get Grab Trigger's Cage off the table and then can go through the graveyard. He would have had to bring in his Abrupt Decays, and I feel like in this in this sort of matchup, he's better served better going off through Ad Nauseam than trying to mess around with bringing in Abrupt Decays to answer Grab Trigger's Cage to keep Pass and Flames alive. Plus, his life total in this matchup is not under duress. Exactly. He's going to be either... He has two modes, alive or dead. He's not taking little pieces of damage along the way. Ross has one blue mana floating here. Spells, five of them. As long as Ad Nauseam cooperates, his Dark Rituals where we'll begin. Empty the Warrants will bring him down to 15. Probe will bring him down to 14. Petal's fine. Probe makes it 13. Brainstorm makes it 12. Ball Ritual makes it 10. Therapy makes it 9. Ponder will make it 8. Ponder will make it 7. Ritual will make it 5. Well, he needs his Infernal Tutor to wrap it up. All right. Doesn't look like he wants to keep going, but he will. 3. This, I imagine, is where we pump the brakes. I think you're correct though he doesn't want to, doesn't seem too thrilled about this. Well, I think he has the opportunity now to just cast a bunch of rituals, make a bunch of goblins, cast Cabal Therapy to get, you know, a troublesome card out of the hand, something that could potentially kill him. He can also work his way into an Infernal Tutor with these Ponders and Probes, even though he can only play one probe for free. I, I think it's one of those spots where he wants to use the spare mana he has what he identifies as spare mana to cast cantrips to maybe find an easier kill, and failing that, try to empty out. Well, he very quickly kept with his ponder, so now he's casting all his ritual, which leads me to believe, okay, it's not Infernal Tutor, it's actually just Tendrils of Agony, and that'll get the job done. Ross Maram going to win game number two here over Peter Johnson, Storm and Sneak and Show, headed to a third one here. Things got a little bit interesting, but able to get the job done. Yeah, Xander Swarm's a really powerful sideboard card in this matchup, uh, because Peter, all he can do is flush the storm and force a will things or kill faster. Ross is going to kill faster on average than Peter is. What, what the edge Peter has is, is Ross can't really interact with him that effectively. And Zen and Swarm is something where it makes it pretty much equal in effectiveness of how they can interact with each other. But Ross gets to exploit the fact that he's a bit faster. It is scary when his Anti Swarm shows up right away because Peter's plan of Force of Will, another permission. Well, that's right off the table. So if I'm him, I may consider Pyroplasm after board. It's not pretty, but it is a counter for Xanthid Swarm. I think that you've seen Empty the Warrens, and you've seen Xanthid Swarm. So I probably would rather have Pyroclasm than, let's say, Grafdigger's Cage. If I have to choose between the two. He's just proven he can beat Grafdigger's Cage. Easily. Yeah, that's, that's part of the reason I would want to probably board it out. A little recency bias there, but when my I opponent beats... My, when my opponent beats a cyborg card that I drew, then I reevaluate. And things. I've never seen Grafdigger's Cage be good against Storm. I see it. I see it drawn a lot. I think that if you're beating them down, and you're putting in the spot where Ad Nauseam is a dicey proposition, Grafdigger's Cage may be okay. But in this kind of matchup where Peter is not taxing his life total, Ad Nauseam is going to be a very reliable way for Ross to win the game. Yeah, rarely do you see a Grafdigger's Cage come into play, and the Storm player panics. Or uh, I have to work through this thing before I can go off. You know, a card like Melee Mage, that'll happen. But yeah. Graftrigger Skates, not so much. I mean, if you're if you're clocking them with, with Delvers and Medley Mages or Nacondles or something like that, I can get behind Graftrigger's Cage. But just sitting, sitting out on the board in play with no pressure, uh, I do not think it's particularly good against Storm. And now, now that you know that you've seen Xanad Swarm, now that you've seen uh, Empty the Warrens also, that Ross brought that in, I like bringing in Pyroclasm. Oh, game number three here between these players. Do you see the sideboards available for them? I don't think a ton is going to change, though. Again, if we were in Peter Johnson's seat, I think Pyroclasm would be in our deck. We'll see if he's changed anything up here for game three. Perhaps he already has Pyroclasm in and just didn't draw it. Maybe. Maybe you could also bring in the Elastorn. I mean, it seems kind of mopey, but it does answer the same cards in the same way. 
it's on the border for me. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not it's saying. Right it, it depends, you know, how good is your 59th and 60th card. Yeah. But there are more tools that Peter can go to to try to fight Xantis Ward and empty the warrants. I don't know if he needs to go that deep. Yeah, it's just another option for it to him. I sure. think it's probably bad, but uh, if your borderline cards maybe are worse than Elishorn, it is possible. Both players present their deck. They'll shuffle each other's. And we'll see what happens here in game three. Game number one on the other side. Well, we already know what happened there. Daryl Ayers did win game number one over David Long. Ayers playing Team Redelver with Kurt Ape over Nimble Mongoose so that he can play Treasure Cruise in his deck. Something he did at Grand Prix, New Jersey to some success. Currently up a game over David Long playing lands, as Long always does. And Long was able to make it through a bad matchup in Omnitel. It looks like he's having trouble with what we believe is a good matchup. Down a game, although we haven't heard an update in a while, which typically, not always, typically means it's good for Lance. Yes, the longer it goes, the better it is. The sleeper hole gets tightened. Yeah. Well, there you go. Wow. The sleeper hold. What happens when in wrestling when they break it and the crowd really starts getting into it? There's got to be some some term for that. And then they rally, and then Daryl super kicks him in the face, and it's yeah. all over. Because that's what happened. Two zero. Imp really impressive stuff. Unbelievable. I thought he was going to get crushed. Actually. Me too. Me too. Without uh, Nimble Mongoose, I thought he was going to get crushed. Well, Daryl's going to play the winner of. This match right here. So, congratulations to him. Very impressive. Critics one match away from a legacy trophy. Unbelievable. It's been so long. It's 2015, right? It is 2015. Okay, I just want to make sure. It's a ponder here for Johnson. Ponder is done resolving. There's a Graft Digger's cage. Here's a Lotus Petal. He's going to cash this in right now to play a cage. Uh, you've got to believe that Ross is capable of killing on turn one with Past in Flames. To use a Lotus for that? Yeah. I agree. Here's the hand. It's a City of Traitors, a Preordain, a Brainstorm, and a Gristlebrand. It's an aggressive use of the cage, to say the least. Unwilling to wait. And having to use a Lotus Petal to facilitate it. But he believes it's very powerful in this matchup. It means that Peter, I think to rationalize that play, it means Peter himself also has to have an extremely explosive opening hand. Whatever he saw with that Ponder believes he can facilitate a very fast kill. Here's a brainstorm from Marion. Take a look at three. And of course, we'll have to put two of them back. The risk with this line of play, besides potentially being short on mana, is that if Ross fires back with discard spells, Peter may just not have enough resources to work with. Yeah. He needs mana plus his lick and stick of a thing to put into play plus the thing to put into play with. And using a Lotus Petal to get Graft Trigger's Cage in play means that duresses and Gabal therapies can be really bad for Peter. If you're Ross, that has to give you a little uh, little bit of scare, I guess. Yeah, for sure. He's using a Lotus Petal to put Cage in play. What's next? And now he's got an idea of what's in his hand, and he knows what's next, which is potentially a turn two show and tell. Brainstorm done resolving. Johnson drawing. It's not a show and tell. It looks like it's a copy of Flusterstorm, so here's a Brainstorm. This could go badly if there's no fetch line there, and there's not. I'm not sure if this is necessarily a winning line, but by playing the Lotus Petal, he gave up on the opportunity to go City of Traders, put Sneak Attack, cross your fingers, hope to get in the next turn. Now he's Brainstorm Block without sufficient mana to get to Sneak Attack, and Ross is, has this turn unchecked to do whatever he wants. Oh. Johnson does have a copy of Prudent in his hand. So he can move, you know, one of the cards from the Brainstorm that's play something back to the bottom and get some looks at some fresh stuff. But I agree. This is a very risky line of play here from Peter Johnson. Here's a Brainstorm yet again. So three cards coming here from Miriam. 
and Ross knows he needs to get a move on. He doesn't know what's coming, but given the way that Peter has played these first couple of turns, if I'm Ross over there, I'm thinking, all right, I gotta, I gotta get going. And it looks like he is. I mean, usually when Ross has acted decisively with his fetch lance, it, it means he's looking to go for it. And he knows that this turn is, you know, the coast is basically clear. Can't do it through passing planes, but as we saw in game two, that doesn't necessarily matter. No. Is it a discard spell? It's like a tax name probe. He wants to see if the coast is clear, perhaps. Maybe this gives him more information on what to name with Cabal Therapy. Either way, you see the hand here of Flusterstorm, Preordained, Sneak Attack, Bristlebrand, and a City of Traitors. Mary, I'm gonna write all these cards down, and then he will draw a card. The ghost is clear as it's ever been. And he can also deduce that there's no land coming for Peter because he would have played a non-City of Traders land last turn. Absolutely. This is a Cabal Therapy. And he will name Sneak Attack. Johnson will draw a card. It's a copy of Bristlebrand. And now here's Preordain. So take a look at a couple. They're both going to go to the bottom, and now he will draw a card. Looks like it's a copy of Omniscience, I believe. And he'll pass the turn back. Mary will untap his two lands. He'll draw. Looks like Dark Ritual was one of them. Remember, Ross has no counter spells in this deck, so I think he absolutely positively wants to go for the kill if he can. Peter's shield's largely down. There is a mystery draw step on top of whatever happened with that preordain. He's going to start with a dark ritual. That's good to go. Now here's a Cabal Therapy. We'll see what he wants to name here. I think he's aiming Force of Will and going for it is my prediction. No cards taken. He did name Force of Will. Two spells cast. Going to sacrifice Polluted Delta. There might be a storm brewing here, Mr. Sullivan. I think so. Gonna get yourself a tropical island. Yeah, not bothering to get a volcanic because, again, pass in flames is not afforded to him with the Graffigger's Cage in play. And the tropical island allows him to cast Andit Swarm in case something weird happens. There's a Lotus Petal and a Lion's Eye Diamond. Storm count moving up. Now it's Nad Nauseam. Stack it, crack it. Three mana floating. Five spells have been cast. It's a lot to work with. Yes, sir. Ritual bring him down to 13. Cabal Ritual bring him down to 11. Let's make it seven. How about five? Still at five. He may stop here as he does a little bit of math. I mean, this does allow him to just empty for a ton. Empty the Warrens has messed things up a little bit, though. He's going into math mode. He's happy with this. Dark ritual. Cabal ritual, of course, with threshold. Pedal. Cracking that. And he may have enough mana to play empty Infernal Tutor and Tendrils of Agony. 
Yep. It's a nice luxury. There are worse places to be. 20 goblins and, you know, 26 points of burn or whatever. Ah, I see what he's going to do. He's going to get a Cabal Therapy here. So not enough. But what he can do is he's going to get a Cabal Ritual. As we have quite a few goblins on hand. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. And he can shred the grip. Force of will to draw. And Peter Johnson will extend the hand. Ross Merriam going to win this match here over Peter Johnson. Two games to one. Storm moving on to the finals. And Merriam and Steven and Daryl Errors will do battle. A huge win for Ross, putting himself in a position to win the whole thing here. Jump up to first place on the leaderboard and proving in games two and three that Graffigger's Cage is not no big shakes.